In my life as a professional animal communicator, I have the wonderful privilege of connecting with animals purely energetically or telepathically and finding out from, from them directly what their thoughts and feelings are about their lives and their environments. Because of the number of incidents of sharks approaching people in the water, there's been a lot of fear and a lot of reaction. And all sorts of measures are being considered, of course, uh, to try and keep the sharks at bay or even worse. There's been votes in some parts of the world for culling them. There's talks of various repellent methods. So I was asked to check in with the great white shark species in that area in particular to hear what their view of humans is, particularly humans in the water. And what's really happening in that dynamic? What's going on when there's a so-called attack? And I do say so-called attack because I can guarantee you the shark's motivation is not attack, is not harm, and is certainly not to make us their food. Who I was speaking with was actually great white shark consciousness in general. And what they had to say about the state of play at the moment is what applies all around the world. The truth of the matter is that their food supply has been so decimated. In particular, they showed me a whole range of middle-sized fish species that are either completely absent or are in very, very short supply in the shark's normal range. So their normal food, for which they would go through normal foraging behavior, is just not available to them anymore at all. This has forced great white sharks to have to come a whole lot more inshore in search of the kind of diversity of food that they need. Most of the time they're just plain hungry a lot of the time. And because of being forced into more inshore waters and away from the threats out there, like long lines and fishing nets, they themselves, the great whites, are in a lot, um, in a lot greater density. They're more tightly packed together as they're cruising our shorelines. The energy between these sharks is therefore competitive. There's a very limited natural food supply. They're all jostling for space and uh, jostling against each other. And this creates a whole field of competitiveness between them. Let's jump track for a minute and look at how humans are being in the water when they are there for recreational purposes. Humans in the water, whether they're paddle skiing or surfing or involved in some sort of water sports, are very often in a very competitive frame of mind and state of being. And on a very real physiological level, that is sending out signals into the ocean. Heart rate variability is increased. The electromagnetic frequency emissions from our hearts, from our brains, are giving the signals into the environment of competitiveness and also hunting. For the surfer who's trying to catch the perfect wave, even in the language of it, there's a clue. Catching a wave has got a, got a feeling of a hunter and a predator. So enter from stage left the other predators, the beautiful apex predators in the ocean, who are themselves feeling competitive between each other. They have a high sensitivity for, and a, and a radar that's almost always on, for sensing any other competitive or predatory uh, signals in an environment and when they sense that they will go and check it out because it might be competition for their own hunting when they are hunting for their real food. When a shark gets closer to a human to come and suss out what is this energy ball that I'm sensing, this, this feeling of contracted energy and they're hunting something, when they come closer most of the time they just turn away realizing that we're not real competition for them at all. They turn away and the surfer or the paddle skier never knows anything about the shark having been there. However, if the shark decides to take a closer kind of inspection, the way that sharks test things is using their mouths. They mouth things to test us out. Of course, if that happens, the first surfer in the water immediately knows the shark is there and what usually follows is absolute panic. Understandable fear, understandable survival instinct kicks in, which unfortunately amplifies the hectic electromagnetic uh, output and brainwave output from the human in the water. Essentially what the human is doing in that moment is behaving very much like prey. Splashing around, being panicked, that's very much a prey response. So at worst a shark may actually take a test bite. The moment they do they realize we're not their natural food. We just taste really, really bad to them. <laughs> it was interesting experiencing from the shark's perspective the, the taste of human flesh and their distaste for it. So the you that. You I actually that. tasted that. Oh. <laughs> quite, quite frankly, sharks view us as a bit too salty and just want to spit us out. Oh. 
And they have no reason to know that a, a little nibble on a human is going to end up potentially being fatal for us because we're likely to bleed out from some artery that they've severed. That's really not their problem and not their intention. If they want to attack us and finish us off, they would do that. They would come back again and again and they would actually eat or ingest us. Fear is the greatest obstacle. And we are often fearful before we even step into the water. And the very thing we fear is what we're going to be putting energy into and, and inviting in. We literally are having the mental images or the quantum holographs of what it is we want to avoid. And that is sending those holographs out into the surroundings as suggestions, as energetic suggestions. So whether or not we are actually in the presence of a shark, fear is a very, very bad idea. And fear is not something that we can try to suppress with force. Far better when we're entering the water would be to adjust our mental state and our state of being and our state of calmness and to actually come up with some silent messages we'd like to send to the unseen sharks out there or any other species out there that we don't wish to see. We are all capable of telepathy. Intuition happens in everyday life as a matter of course, usually only when it really matters or is urgent or when we have a vague gut feeling or a hunch that proves to be true. But we can all choose to have a telepathic thought and just send it out by simply intending to send it out to our target audience, in this case sharks. We know that it lands there because it is being broadcast from our being, whether we like it or not. Everything that we are thinking and feeling is being broadcast. Therefore, we may as well broadcast the good stuff or the helpful stuff. And so my advice for people who are going to be getting into the water, that is shark's home and their rightful place to be, when we want to go and have some fun there for recreation purposes, I suggest we start from onshore, standing there on the beach with our kayak or with our surfboard in hand or just sitting quietly and taking no more than a few minutes to simply address the sharks, address them silently. Even better to send a nice greeting, to send a greeting. Doesn't matter what language you're thinking in, they will get it on the quantum level. This is how telepathy works. Send a greeting and you have to be genuinely, of course, honoring and respecting their right to be there. When you're in the water, it's a very good idea to briefly and frequently keep on updating your communication and topping up with the, the good and helpful thoughts. A very good visualization to hold is that you have a bubble around you not from a defensive and protected place where you're feeling very vulnerable and weak and just trying to be all fierce as a response, because that wouldn't work at all. That would just attract uh, attention. I'm talking about putting a bubble around yourself as an imagined thing. You imagine this to be a radius around your whole body and below and even above for that matter of just peaceful energy and an absence of anything that can harm you imagining this constant buffer between yourself and any sharks in the area so that even if one does see you and even if the small percentage of the time that that happens you see the shark in turn as well you just keep this visual barrier you imagine a few meters out from your body and you know they will not come closer than that barrier that works much more effectively than other technology-based uh, so-called shark repellents that emit uh, frequency or electricity because that in itself unfortunately really attracts and draws in the sharks to come and see what that's about. Much better to make it your own energy that you are adjusting and when you are in a resonant state with presumably the whole point of being in the ocean in the first place is to be enjoying nature, to be without sounding weird or hippie about it, to be in the flow of the moment and of the sea it's important to be in a resonant state because then you, the human, are not going to stand out as this big discordant or weird thing worthy of further investigation. I've been fortunate enough to be swimming in the wild Indian Ocean with completely wild uh, bottlenose dolphins and if, uh, in a few different uh, of those occasions I've had sharks approach, tiger sharks, uh, black tip sharks, and by simply maintaining my innocence towards them and simple appreciation of them, despite the fact that I personally really don't want to be up close to a shark underwater, that extending my appreciation, my greeting and holding an idea of that buffer has made them swim around me without coming uh, within that radius that I have selected and I have chosen. It's really about who we're being and we need to stop being competitive or even fearful in the water. Sharks do not attack humans. If anything, if they're interested enough, they might come closer to investigate when they're picking up on certain kinds of energy, particularly the competitive kind. And the classic case was in the final heat of the surfing competition. 
You see, if sharks attack, they, they do what's called pulling a vertical from underneath. They start out from underneath you and very quickly zoom up and will just grab you from underneath. When they're mersing along, minding their own business or coming to investigate, they come in clear view. Usually you can see their dorsal from above the surface. And the dorsal fin of that shark that was approaching McFanning long before he saw it was very clear above the surface. The shark came the shark came close to do a bit of a swim by and in so doing got caught in his leash and then the panic that ensued, both the shark and human were obviously very anxious and in this kind of tumble to try to free themselves of each other. And even in that fright, the shark could so easily have done something to harm Mick, but he didn't. He just wanted to get away, came a bit too close, sussed out this human. But what I'm intrigued about is the fact that the shark did come that close at the absolute peak of a surfing competition in terms of this, this state of mind that I'm speaking about. When humans are in a competitive state of mind, uh, that certainly attracts the attention of other predators who for various reasons of short supply of food and those things I've mentioned already are by nature having to be competitive with each other. There are over 20 species of sharks in the world and they are all at the point of near collapse, near extinction. They deserve to have what's left of their home be left alone and to be allowed to mind their own business. What I would say to the authorities who are considering shark deterrent or shark management uh, techniques is to please consider the shark's right to be there. Many of the proposed solutions to keep humans safe from sharks actually involve huge damage to the sharks. There's all sorts of netting and culling and baiting being proposed. Even things that might seem more benign, like putting up various kinds of shark nets to cordon off certain areas, is fundamentally altering their behavior and not only their access to the inshore areas, but also other marine life as well. There's another consideration too. If a hole is made in the population of any species that we humans have chosen to go and exterminate locally or try to reduce the numbers of, something called the species survival syndrome kicks in. That species knows about the sudden gap and the sudden hole in their population at that place and the reproduction rate increases hugely for them to fill that gap and to fill that hole. So predator control by lethal means never ever ever works, not on land and not at sea. In my work as an animal communicator I am again and again humbled by the fact that beautiful animals of all kinds who are being destroyed by humans because we don't want them around or we reckon there's not enough space for those animals anymore. I am again and again amazed how those animals haven't just actually risen up against us because guess what? They know very well what humans are doing towards them. They could choose to attack us, choose to maim us, choose to trample us to death with their large elephants and the care that they have not to attack us, not to just be reactive and aggressive like us humans are. The compassion that they have for us, just continuing to be themselves and just reflect to us who we're being and keep on taking it and keep on taking it is nothing short of amazing. I'm constantly humbled by that and sometimes quite embarrassed to be a member of the human species. In summary, the great white sharks are asking for peaceful coexistence. They have no issue with us being in the water if we can be in the water in a good way without meaning them any harm. They are asking for peaceful coexistence. So in short, the best way to achieve that is to really enjoy the water, enjoy it for what it offers you. Enjoy being there fully immersed in the moment, pardon the pun, and I do mean in the moment. Be present to everything that's around you. Enjoy what's underneath you in the ocean. Remember to look behind you from time to time, not out of fear, but because you want to appreciate where you are. And remember that the very reasons that draw us into water in the first place are supposed to be fun, not competitive, not having to jostle for the perfect wave. Let's try to keep ourselves safe and in a good state of being while we're in the water and we will have the most magical encounters, both with the natural elements and with the other animals whose home it is.